What is up, Chris Look Podcast, episode 25. Today, we got a lot of topics. Last time I tried this by myself, I was worried I didn't have enough content. This time, not as worried. Don't think I have enough here. I got all kinds of notes spread out here. Here's hoping things go well here. We're opening this thing up. We're talking about a game. We're talking about the brain. We're talking about a guy retiring maybe a little bit too early, according to some. Uh, we're talking about Andrew Luck, Indianapolis Colts. So last week I was at my buddy Eric's house. His son had his third. Uh, he turned three, so they had a little birthday bash for the young man. We're there. It's like 8, 9, 9 o'clock maybe, East Coast time. This dude, George, is like, hey, man, Andrew Luck retired. We're like, really? Interesting. Start looking it up. You know, that gets confirmed. We see that uh, I think he's 29, and he just stepped away. Now, he's had a rash of injuries over the past couple of years. Um, you know, you hear some pro athletes talk, and it's like the rehab part of it, coming back. You know, then when you do get back, you're a little bit hesitant. You don't know if that knee of yours is going to hold up or, you know, one wrong movement, one wrong cut, and the knee's blown out again. The Achilles tendon goes one wrong hit, one blind side, landed on your shoulder the wrong way, you know, rotator cuff, concussion, stuff like that. You're just like one hit away from having that devastating career-ending injury. That's probably playing in the back of your mind. You get hurt a few years in a row. You got to rehab, rehab, the grind of that coming back, spending four, six, eight months just trying to get back to, you know, a shell of what you were previously. It's got to be tough, psychologically draining. Then when you do come back, you're getting hit again. Your team's losing. Maybe the environment, your instincts. Maybe you're like, I, I, I think I'm better than this situation. I'm going to step away and move on to other things. These are, I'm just kind of speculating some things that might have gone on now. Andrew Luck is a Stanford-educated man. He announces that he's done. You know, we see these NFL guys that can't walk anymore. They're in their 40s and 50s. We see guys with terrible brain injuries, uh, don't even know their wives anymore. You know, we see, we see all kinds of stuff, 20-something surgeries. We got these linemen that are, you know, 100 pounds overweight. Um, it's like, do we really care about the individual? We're just caring about entertainment. And when you see Andrew Luck retire and he gets booed, you know, that's kind of your answer that as a fan – not me. I'm not considering myself a fan. I like the game of football, but like, I will not act like a lunatic at a football game. I will not boo a guy if he retires. These are like individual decisions. So that individual that say or individuals, there were some people that were booing Andrew Luck. It's like we have a guy that decided he's actually going to step up and uh, and say um, enough's enough, basically, and just walk away from the game. And he gets booed for it. So now you got the local sports writers that saying calling him all kinds of names. You got all these other people calling him all kinds of stuff. Now, I think Andrew Luck has it together in a sense that he's just not going to be worried about that 42-year-old beer-drinking, overweight dude booing him in the crowd. Like, I'm sure he's okay and, and not too worried about what that guy thinks. But you know what? Not every player might be like that. And, you know, they're going to have to worry about what their family thinks. They're not going to be getting those paychecks anymore. They, maybe they didn't save the money that they should have. You know, maybe that $7 million offer from another team – Looks pretty darn appealing if you could just keep it together for one more year. These are the things that must be going through some players' heads now. Or that other factor is like, it's not going to happen to me. I'm not going to be like that. I, I won't have dementia. I'm not going to act violent. I'm not going to drive my car in the opposite direction on the highway and commit suicide or kill myself, drink, you know, whatever some of these guys were drinking, like motor oil, whatever, to kill themselves. Or uh, just people that just shoot themselves, man. Uh it's not going to happen to me. Like, that's another thing that guys seem to have. It's like a curse, I think. But anyway, you know, Andrew Luck speaks out, says, I'm, enough's enough. I'm stepping away. He gets treated like crap for it. But people want people to speak up when they're, when they're feeling wrong or feeling, uh, you know, they don't want to have that brain issue. So he's saying, all right, I'm going to step away. I'd rather rather be one year too early than one year too late. And he's getting crap for it. Um, in addition to that, this man was great at football. He's a smart dude, went to Stanford. Maybe he's into reading books, you know, stuff like that. You see these things that Andrew Luck's doing, these, like, you know, crazy things with, his, with uh, educational stuff, learning, continually learning. And it's like maybe he just played the game because he was good at it. Maybe it's not like his passion. You know, just because football is a cool thing and we could sit back and watch the sport. I mean, I coached it for 10 years uh, high school at the high school level, so – you know, I, one of the reasons I got out was like some of these people, see these adults, parents, co other coaches were like, 
losing sleep because a 15-year-old kid dropped a pass or some 17-year-old fumbled, some 16-year-old missed a block. They're going nuts, like yelling, freaking out, not talking to anybody, storming off the field after a loss and going home without even saying a word to anybody. These guys are in their 50s saying it's like, I just shook my head sometimes. I'm like, these are my peers. I didn't feel comfortable, you know, in that setting. Um, Maybe Andrew Luck had those same feelings. Like, I play this sport because I'm good at it. Um, I might might be cashing some checks and making some money and taking care of my family, taking care of a different foundation, taking care of whatever he wanted to take care of. But at the end of the day, it's a job for him. And how many people out there, how many of you guys listening to this thing like your job, where if you could be financially set – and step away from it at the age of 29 or 30, would you do it? Uh, I would. I'll throw my hand up there. Um, I'm 33 and still trying to fight for that. So I, I got no disrespect or no ill feelings towards this man. If, if, he, if it's not his passion, if he could wake up the next day and feel good about it, good. Like you don't need to play a game just because it looks cool and people, everybody out there saying, oh, if I could play one more game or, man, I would play that for free, stuff like that. It's all bull crap. It's all guys sitting on the couch doing nothing. Um, you know, it is their job. They don't have to love their job. It could be their third best, the, the third favorite sport that they had, you know, in high school, but they got the college scholarship there. And then from college, they did pretty well, and they got the NFL deal. So it's like just because they're playing a game and it looks fun doesn't mean they love it. Anyhow, I'm all for that. Interested to see, though, where this head stuff goes. Uh Andrew, you know, some guys over in the past couple years, some young guys, guys in the prime are retiring. Now we got a high-profile quarterback stepping down. Is the NFL going to do anything about this? Or are they just going to continue to be pulling in that big-time revenue and big-time? Well, the ratings are dipping a little bit, but are they still? Are they going to say, hey, we, we might have to make a change here. Maybe we're playing too many games. Maybe we cut some stuff back instead of adding more games. Maybe they try to protect their players a little bit more. Maybe they try to, you know, put something in contracts guaranteeing these guys some sort of treatment, some sort of care, so that when they're out of the game and they're 42, you know, a guy, Lorenzo McClain, old fullback, who probably just bashed his head for a living, is freaking out, and he's having these moments on, like, Twitter this past week that were like, you're reading this stuff, he's crying out for help. Um, And it'll be sad, say, in a couple months, say, if something were to happen to him where he harmed himself, it's like, it's right there, guys, he's crying out, he's asking for help, it's online, hundreds of thousands of people probably have seen this now because... You know, Yahoo covered a story. Or some other local sport or some other sports site covered the story. Like, so who knows, man? Who knows where this is going to go? The sport's weird. I got out of it. I got out of coaching because, you know, not because it's a violent game. You know, people always ask if I had a son, would would he play? And I'm like, I don't know if he wanted to. I guess maybe. But I talked about this with Jason Brader. I talked about this with Frank Donnelly. The past couple podcasts. It's like. You know, you got to get coached up on it. You got to have the right people in place to teach your child. And, um, you know, I would never push anybody to do anything, and 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 that's that. But, you know, it is a violent sport. It is a crazy sport, and maybe there's going to be some changes. They're starting to do it at the youth level. Let's see what college does. Let's see what the NFL does now. Speaking of kids, found this cool article. I'm moving on now. I got a lot of topics to cover. Uh, we've got some stuff about kids. We have some stuff about time-restricted eating. We've got some stuff. Leo Tolstoy, A Confession. This book is absolutely crazy. I'm, I'm hitting that at the end there, so I'm making you wait. Um, I'm making you wait to get a piece of that action. Uh, you know, I, I came across this article, Science Daily. A lack of self-control during adolescence is not uniquely human. Impulsiveness in adolescence isn't just a phase. It's biology. You know, impulsi- impulsivity and sensation seeking. That's what a lot of these kids are doing. You know, when they're out doing these crazy things and you see them doing something funky, um, I love watching my daughter now. I mean, she's only a year and a half, so, you know, she's not she's not too crazy, but she is crazy with some of her uh, a- actions. You know, she's just feeling some stuff out. She's trying to seek a new sensation and find some things. It's kind of cool. And when the brain's undeveloped, um, sorry, the undeveloped brain survived evolution, allowing for new experiences to provide info about the environment. So all of these new things, are, so the brain that survives uh, is getting is getting exposed to new things in the environment, which is kind of cool, and it's allowing the human, which is us, to evolve into this crazy species that we are today. Um, so, you know, self control isn't about the ability in the moment to inhibit a behavior; it's about preparing yourself um, ahead of time to create the appropriate plan. This one, I like that topic. I like this. I want to circle that one because it's something I want to talk about. Self control. It's so hard to kind of control what you're doing. 
you're out there, you've got temptation everywhere throwing yourself at you. It's so hard to over and over again to say no, 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 no. I was just talking to somebody at the gym this week about it. We're talking about these movie stars and say they're, you know, uh, a lot of people were talking about uh, Star is Born. Do you see this chemistry, Lady Gaga, Bradley Cooper, people are like, something might be going on there. They see them perform together and they're looking at each other. It's like, how do some of these people, whether it's their actors or they're like wealthy and there is temptation around there, um, constant temptations, like how do they say no all the time? And, you know, to have self-control, they need to have some sort of plan and action. They need to have some sort of rules and some sort of stipulations up front to prevent that stuff from happening. Um, prepare yourself ahead of time. You know you might be exposed to something. You know that, hey, if you don't want to drink one night, but all your buddies are going out, you need to know, like, I'm either... Uh, not going to this spot or maybe I'll drive and I'll just be that responsible person and give people rides if they need it but you need to have a plan like hey I'm not doing this tonight because I'm doing X tonight afterwards or I have to get up early tomorrow I gotta work I don't want to feel like crap I don't feel like drinking you know whatever it is you gotta have some sort of plan in action I guess you could just say no but then you might get those guys that are be like hey trying to twist your arm a little bit to get out there and do a little boozing have a plan in place um, in experience uh, you know, having the experience of saying no over and over and over again is going to make it easier down the road. Those first couple of times might be tough, but you just got to keep trying and, and keep working. Also here from the article, there needs to be a period where the human is actively encouraged to explore because gaining these new experiences will help mold the adult trajectory. Another good topic here. Uh, actively encouraging our youth and our children, even up into adolescence, to explore things. Super important. We can't say no to stuff. We want them to explore. We don't want them to be reckless with what they're doing. So you want to kind of hopefully have some guidelines in place that like, hey, 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 we're not doing that. We're not jumping off that, that building right over there. All right. We're not jumping off the roof into the pool. Not a good idea. If you want to jump off the uh, pool deck and hit a cannonball, that's okay. But we're not cannonballing off the roof. Some things, you know, are a little bit too dangerous. Don't want to explore that. Let's try to rework it doing another thing. But um, as an adult, if you're not exposed to things, like I remember having some talks with people about uh, kids going to college. And, you know, you see I had a friend that grew up in the Lancaster area and didn't drink at all. Wasn't really exposed to, you know, some things growing up. When he went to college, it went haywire on him. Now, this could be an individual that just had that personality that like, hey, um, whether he was exposed to it or not growing up, he, he might have had, say, an issue with drinking. You know, it's hard to say that because we, we don't know. But, like, you know, there's always that question where it's like, do you want to expose your kids to some of these potential risky things before, you know, it's too late and they just start exploring stuff on their own? I don't know. I mean, I don't want to be a parent that would encourage drinking for, for a high school kid. But uh, maybe uh, if you do have some parameters in place, or if the kid does drink, you know, you need to talk about it with them and not just kind of, uh, not just kind of pretend it doesn't happen and be kind of naive about it. And so it's like, so what do you do? These kids are going to experience things. Um, it's part of us being a human. But having having a plan in place is like super important. Um, and you know, it, it, it's only going to help us as we be, we become adults. A lot of people will complain about things. Um, with kids these days and I think it's I think it's the adults that are that are the problem and how these kids are being raised you know they're too uh too helpful I mean these, there's kids that are doing incredible things though like there's 20 year olds that are doing these high level mass and they're so responsible and they've got all you see a high school kid's resume and what they're trying to do just to get into college they did more stuff more volunteer work more just good in general in their high school years than I did almost in my whole life I feel like sometimes but you know are they really learning these things? Or are they just doing it to kind of advance themselves? So I don't know. It's tough. Kids these days are doing a lot, but they're also like, you know, in a bubble. Don't know how to navigate it. Um, I did want to backtrack too one, on one topic here that I just kind of thought about uh, when I was going through this. And I was coming in listening to the Jocko podcast, and I was, I was thinking, um, anyway, where this is tying in, during adolescence. If you're, if you're not exposed to things during adolescence, it's going to affect you into your adult life. You know, I was listening to Jocko. He's talking about Jordan Peterson was on. And they're like, there's a protocol for everything. Any kind of issue you might have psychologically, you know. You know, they, they were referring to the psychologist as a mind mechanic. 
I've talked to psychologists. I've seen therapists. I see one now. It's the best thing that I've done. I just started doing it recently because there's ways that uh, there's communication issues with people. There's like uh, how I respond to certain situations is kind of crappy. So it's like you could go in and just talk to somebody and just going in and talking is like the best thing ever. And these therapists are like mind mechanics is what Jocko was talking about. So I wanted to kind of tie this into the first two things I talked about. You know, Andrew Luck, there's a certain stigma with him. Say, hey, I don't want to do this. Uh, I don't want to go seek out help for another area. Say some other guy wants to do that maybe. And it's like people will kind of look at you with a sideways look like, huh, interesting. So this guy could potentially be damaged, whatever. Um, and then with this impulsivity stuff where it's like, let's say I'm having a hard time. Uh, let's think of a good example. Uh, so let's say my whole life, this is not true, by the way. Uh, let me clarify that. Let me say Jimmy over here. Jimmy's whole life, um, every time he spoke out against something, he got smacked with the back of his hand. As Jimmy grows up, he's probably, because of those experiences that he had in adolescence, he's probably not going to want to speak up because he thinks that every time he does speak up, he's going to get smacked with the back of somebody's hand. So then young Jimmy there needs to go see his mind mechanic, a.k.a. A therapist, psychologist, whoever, and just talk about things and then talk about new things and getting exposed to new things, new experiences, uh, which is kind of like exposure therapy where it's like, hey, if you're scared of something, expose yourself to it a little bit, see how it goes, and then each time expose yourself more and more and more and more. If you're scared of a tarantula, put the tarantula in the front of the room, just leave it there for a minute, then get rid of it. You're exposed to it. Usually you would freak out this time. You said, okay, I'll suck it up for one minute. You suck it up for one minute. Next time, tarantula is 10 feet away from you and you just take it in one minute again, whatever. Next thing you know, the tarantula is right in front of you. You're there for five minutes. doesn't even bother you. You're doing a podcast. doesn't even bother you. Um, so for an Andrew Lux case, not having a fear of speaking out is okay. Seeking help is okay. In adolescence, what happens in adolescence is going to mold who, mold who you are as an adult. It's almost like Pavlov's dog. You almost get conditioned to act in a certain behavior by what happens in your childhood. Exposing yourself to new things is going to help you kind of expand and ex expand your uh, responses, expand your experiences, expand how you handle situations. All good things. Don't put your kid in a bubble. Expose them to a bunch of stuff. Be careful. Don't, don't allow it to be reckless. And let the kids have a little bit of fun and explore. Hopefully that wasn't all over the place because I had three different thoughts going there and I didn't know how to tie them all in. And I almost forgot about the mind mechanic one, but I thought that needed to be part of this. Next thing. People ask, what is the difference between time-restricted eating and fasting? That was a question that gets brought up a lot. My cohort here at the gym is like, oh, same thing. Other people, oh, so you fast. And I'm like, well... I guess, but not really. There's a difference. You know, with time-restricted eating, I stumbled upon this Rhonda Patrick's podcast, Dr. Ruth Patterson, breast cancer uh, doctor, right? Dr. Ruth, uh, I don't think I'm missing this up. I think this was from her study. So they put, uh, they put these women that had breast cancer, um, they put them on a, on a, in an eating window, 11-hour eating window, it was, th it was a 13-hour fast, but they were allowed to have black coffee for two hours of it. So it was like a 13-hour fast. Two of those hours, they were allowed to consume some coffee, but it was 11 hours of not eating. Um, so with this, they found that these women, they took in the same amount of calories, they ate the same amount of food, just kept it in a window. 36% reduction in breast cancer recurrence. It almost sounds unbelievable. I heard this, and I'm like, what is this time-restricted eating stuff? I need to get into it a little bit more. Rhonda Patrick was the one that had it all. Check out her podcast her website, Found My Fitness. She is legit. Uh, scientist, does a lot of the research. A lot of the, uh, She basically does a lot of this herself. She wants to live forever and feel good while living. She has a little kid now, a little bit older than my baby. So it was actually pretty good timing because I could see how she handled her pregnancy and handled post-pregnancy stuff and the breastfeeding and what to try to give your child and all this other stuff. Anyway, Rhonda Patrick, genius. I think so anyway. So with this, you got an 8 to 12 hour daytime window. You know, there's no calorie restriction. You eat what you want over the course of that 8 to 12 hours. Now, they, wanna, they, want, they want this to, to occur during the daytime or eating window because it's going to align with your body's innate 24-hour circadian system. So time-restricted eating aligns with your circadian clock. Um, 
They've done research on humans and animals. You know, they've seen weight loss, reduced fat mass, improved heart function, enhanced aerobic capacity without really altering, altering the diet quality or the quantity. All they did was change the time of day that they ate. Um, one thing that they did notice, too, is that your clock rhythms change markedly with your age. So as you're sleeping less, sleeping more, whatever it may be, um, your, your circadian rhythm, your circadian clock is going to change. That's something you need to remember and keep, um, keep in mind. Now, they, they, one thing that really, that really kind of, I don't want to say convinced me, but played a big role in my decision to get on this time-restricted eating was that your glucose, um, your, a glucose spike was lowest in the morning and highest in the evening. So if you do slip up a little bit and you have that piece of cake, uh, you have that donut, some of these sugar-coated treats that uh, we like to eat. If you have it in the morning, your glucose response is going to be a little bit is going to be less, marketably less. That's up for debate, but it is going to be less in the morning than it would be at night, which is good. Hopefully, it keeps the diabetes away. Um, you know, if you drink some caffeine, be careful because that's going to mess with your clock. That's why in that study with the breast cancer stuff, you start drinking caffeine. It's not food, but it starts these metabolic things in your body. Um, caffeine is taken up in the gut, gets metabolized in the liver. It activates a, me a metabolic process and potentially uh, potentially starts the circadian clock. So if you have a drink at 5 a.m. of coffee, that could potentially start your clock. It just depends on how strict you want to be. If you have that caffeine late at night, it might alter your circadian clock a little bit, and it's going to affect your sleep time. Um, so obviously that's stuff you want to keep uh, keep in mind. But then on the flip side of it too, you know, polyphenols, this is where everything gets tricky because that's in caffeine, right? You're in a, or some black coffee. It induces autophagy in the liver, muscle, and heart four hours post-consumption in mice, all right? Now we're talking about animal studies. What do I think of animal studies and how legitimate they are? It's hard to say. I mean, they're doing them. They found some good stuff uh, over the years, so to speak, with animal studies that I think that uh, there's enough uh, evidence that says, yeah, they are good, but to say what's going to happen in a, my, in a mouse and in a human, uh, I guess it's not 100%. So you got to be careful, I guess, with what you read. Frequent disruptions in light, dark, and eating slash fasting cycles can lead to circadian and metabolic dysfunction. This could lead to a higher incidence of several chronic diseases, including cancer and neurological disease. So disruptions in light, dark, we're talking about that, uh, we're talking about shift workers, maybe that night shift worker where they're up at night sleeping during the day, that's going to affect what you're doing. And eating slash fasting cycles, um, take advantage of it for the better, um, which is what kind of time restricted eating does. It is, um, you know, you're not, you're not using, you're not, uh, having these huge, huge eating windows and you're not feasting for like 24 straight hours. Um, because then your body just chronically trying to digest food. It's constantly trying to work. It's going to affect your sleeping if you're digesting food, affecting sleep, all this other stuff. Like this could affect over time, could lead to chronic disease, whether it's going to trigger some inflammation in your body, yada, yada, yada. Um, stuff that we've talked about before. Foundmyfitness.com, Rhonda Patrick, check it out. The breast cancer stuff was Rhonda, uh, Rhonda, no, sorry, Ruth Patterson on Rhonda Patrick's podcast. That was uh, pretty eye-opening. He has Sachin Panda, another guy, Walter Longo, um, who has a book out now. Um, I, didn't, I didn't get to it yet. I'm going to cover it at some point in time. Um, you know, it just kind of shows the benefits of it all. Taking advantage of your circadian clock, timing your eating with your circadian rhythms, and uh, feeling good while doing it. I mean, I think it's a game changer. It kind of sets some of those rules um, that I just kind of talked about, uh, you know, with having self-control. You know, if you have some, if you prepare yourself and have a plan in place, something kind of set in stone, you're going to be able to have, you're going to be able to control your, uh, you, you know, your crappy eating habits if you have a plan in place. So it's like if I'm going to eat from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., I know if I go with my friends at 7 p.m., I'm just not going to eat, just not going to do it. Uh, I'll go out and drink some water and hang out and laugh a little bit. But if you have that plan in place, you're not going to be eating wings like I did last night at the new wing place in town. Mediocre, we'll say, or trying out some of their steak meat. I fell off the wagon last night and ate later than usual. But I was like, yeah, whatever, I'm out with my friends. Um, which kind of just goes against what I said there. But there's there's obviously some uh, 
Ah, there's obviously some failure involved. I guess I failed. I didn't follow my plan last night. But I also didn't want to be some sort of diet snob and being like, hey, guys, I don't need I don't need this stuff after a certain hour. I just wanted to go and enjoy some, some time with my friends. So that was that. Time-restricted eating. I dig it. 8 to 12-hour window. I would recommend being uh, careful with what you eat. But for a lot of the research, they didn't restrict any. They didn't restrict calories, and they uh, weren't too worried about quality of food, um, which is interesting to me. I would love to see people eat good, but uh, you know, to get some positive results, you don't necessarily need to, which is interesting. But I'll just leave it at that. I won't recommend it. I'm just throwing it out there. Anyhow, man, the Dirty John podcast. Let me tell you something. You wanna, if you're in, see, this is this is what makes me a little bit of, of a weirdo. I'm not trying to, I'm not gonna try to spoil this at all. But this thing had three things, man. Three things, three keys that, that I would say that I kind of enjoy: manipulation, evil, and something we talked about. One of my favorite movies, A Time to Kill. Evil and A Time to Kill. I think are kind of they kind of intertwine there because when I think I'm gonna skip manipulation for a second. When I think about evil, which I just kind of came across this a few years ago, I'm gonna talk about Jordan Peterson again. Highly influenced by this guy. He's got a lot of content out, and I just love it. He was basically like we are, and and also uh, Philip Zambardo. This was the cool thing. Uh, California school. I think it was Stanford Prison Experiments. Look this out. I'm diving into this real quick. So long story short, I think we're in the 70s. Zimbardo, um, I watched it on Netflix, but also heard an interview with him, and I got to buy his book, uh, something about the devil, something. But anyway, we're all capable of doing evil. This Stanford Prison Experiment, Zimbardo is the warden. He's basically in the office watching this stuff play out. They, they give some kids some money, like small amount of money, but they're college students. They're like, yep, I'm in. Let's do this thing. They pick out of a hat, they, they somehow pick who's going to be a prisoner, who's going to be a guard. Well, I don't know the time frame, but shortly into it, these guards really, really took on the role of guard. They started, you know, they had, they had these prisoners. I think it's like less than eight hours. They had to cut the experiment, something crazy, because it just went totally haywire. The guards totally abused their power. They had, they had uh, bags on people's heads. They made them pee in their stall, in their prison uh, cell. And meanwhile, Zimbardo, who's the psychologist at the school, is watching all this as the warden. He started, he started, uh, he, he embodied the role as the warden. And his girlfriend, who I think became his wife, came in and was like, hey, you need to stop this experiment. They're making kids, they're making these kids pee in there. They're, they're sleeping in the same room with human excrement and stuff like that. But Zimbardo was watching this thing. He, he, he was like, yes, those are the guards. They're just doing their job, yada, yada, yada. He got caught up in it. The guards got caught up in it. It flipped like that. Um, and the no, the Lucifer effect, that's what he calls it, the Lucifer effect, where basically it's like these guys were put in these situations, they took that role and they ran with it, and they started doing some not-so-kind things, maybe even evil things, some might say. That was one thought. I remember hearing this interview and watching this a few years ago, and I was like, huh, that's crazy. These guys are nuts. I can't believe they did that to another human being. And it was on, I think, under 10 hours. Um... That was one aspect. Then I hear Jordan Peterson. He's saying, I'm 33 years old right now. Let's say I'm 33 and it's Germany in 1935. You know, what would I do? Would I be a Nazi? That's a thought that I never thought of. And, and, and I'm like, well, what are my choices? Uh, stand out against the regime that's about to come to power. Join. Become a part of the team. Or kind of flee. If I flee and leave, probably the best idea. If I stay and fight against them, I may end up in a prison camp, or I might just be murdered. Or if I join the winning team at the, well, maybe not necessarily at the time, but it was trending in that direction. Hitler's group was like starting to blow up. So do I join forces with these guys? I don't know. I think we're all capable. Like I may, uh, Hopefully this doesn't get cut into a small uh, into a small segment and blown up on the internet. Uh, you know, I, I may have I may have fallen victim to that manipulation and joined the party. Don't know, and that just goes to show that the, the environmental stuff that is going on will influence how we uh, how we act as a human being. 
And, you know, there's a fine line in all of us. I don't remember who said this, but there's a fine line that kind of runs through every person's heart. And there's good and evil on each side of it. And it's very small. And, you know, circumstances and, and all this other stuff could could make us uh, cross that line over and start doing some awful things. Now, we're going back to Dirty John. Manipulation. I'm trying not to spoil this, but honestly, if you didn't watch it or listen to it by now, that's kind of your problem. This guy, Dirty, this guy, John, John Meehan, serial manipulator, woman abuser, um, con man, convict, potentially, uh, you know, potentially uh, very dangerous man. Uh, I don't think there was a case proven that he like violently hurt somebody, but it could have happened. He had access to drugs. He was an uh, anesthetist. They found multiple times over this man's life, you know, he had he had weapons. He had tranquilizers, basically. He had stuff that would put people under chloroform ingredients, knives, things of that nature. So he manipulated women. He was a good-looking dude. You know, people believe the hype. Hey, I'm a doctor. I was just on Doctors Without Borders. I was in Iraq. I had to kill somebody over there, he's telling people. You know, it, it wasn't that hard. Um, I could hit you. So, you know, I could hit that target from a 1,000 feet away, yada, yada, yada. So you're hearing this stuff, and I'm listening. I'm like, why does a doctor have a gun anyway in Iraq? I was like, I didn't know that. that, that that's not even believable. But, hey, whatever. He's telling this to some women, man, and they're just buying it, hook, line, and sinker. He's telling them all this stuff. You know, I do, I'm do. i doing this and that, putting his scrubs on, going to work, you know, still playing this whole doctor thing. Um, but then he starts to get figured out, hey, where are you actually going? Why are you come? They had cameras in the house. Why do you leave and then come back 40 minutes later? Why are you bouncing all over the place? Why is there no record of you being a doctor? Why do you have this um, diploma saying you're a nurse anesthetist? Like... What's going on here? Gets arrested for some other stuff. Gets out. Still able to manipulate the woman. Um, you know, she, she was believing him still. And then next thing you know, things go haywire. It, you know, it reminds me of all these cults that are out there where these people start selling a, a bill of goods and, man, people just buy it. And it's like, what is up with the brain? And why are we so fragile that, uh, that, that you know, we just allow ourselves to be manipulated over and over again? Um, it happened to this woman. It happened to many women. It happened to men, potentially. This guy, Dirty John, his his reach was far, especially with online dating now. You know, he sends out 50 messages. He might get 30 hits. That's 30 potential people. And if 27 of them say no, figure him out and don't buy it, there's still three people that will buy it. So it's just playing a numbers game. And then uh, a few months later, let's say you find the next, the next batch of 20 or 30 people and you start sending some messages and this guy refined his skill set just years and years and years of manipulating people. He got pretty good at it until eventually, you know, time runs out on it and you get figured out and things happen. So we got the manipulation aspect. This guy started doing evil. He would take pictures of women while they were dating. You know, basically he was just building up uh, it's kind of like a blackmail portfolio where he's like, hey, I know these, this stuff's going to go haywire. Oh, these women also were wealthy, of course, right? I'm going to get some money out of this girl. I'm going to send some nude photos of the of this poor woman to her family and say, look at the, look at your daughter, yada, 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 you know, this, that, and the other thing. Hey, if you want me to put this out on this website, uh, you know, give me X amount of money. I'm going to expose you. I'm going to go to the police. I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing. Just creating these crazy stories in order to extract money, extract a car, extract a place to live. I mean, the guy was good, man. But, you know... Anyway, just, just evil, straight up evil. And then that brings us to the last part of it, A Time to Kill. Um, great movie, love it. Topics, for some reason, this was brought up for like two or three weeks in a row on random nights at the gym. You know, my boy Fiegel, who uh, cuts these videos up, said, hey, violence is never the answer. And probably true 99 out of 100 times. But, uh, you know, Samuel L. Jackson in that movie, A Time to Kill, he probably... He was probably a little bit late on the killing poor part because he didn't catch him in the act. But in his mind, he was like, you know what? These guys did some awful things to my little girl, and I'm going to kill them. Um, spoiler alert, Samuel does kill some people in that movie. But uh, but anyway, is there a time to kill, man? Uh, the answer is probably 
maybe, sometimes, one out of a hundred times, yes. Anyhow, Dirty John Podcast, don't want to spoil the ending, somebody's dying, somebody dies at the end, and when you hear that story about how, about what happened, you might agree that yes, there is a time to kill. Anyway, good podcast, listen to it, Wondry, uh, Wondry puts out some great stuff, man, gotta tell you. Good podcast. Now we are getting into it. More dark, heavy stuff. Somebody told me today, or on Wednesday at the gym, man, you read some heavy, dark stuff. And I was like, yes. Yes, I do. Leo Tolstoy. The book we're breaking down is called A Confession. All right. Last time was Walden. This time is A Confession. What are we trying to do here? We're trying to get our mind right. That's me personally. I told you I went to go see a therapist before I talked to a psychologist. I'm trying to read some of these great uh, great thinkers, people that really question life, really question what's going on in this world. Um, and I think it's like a never-ending thing. Like I've said a few times, I'm in my 30s. I'll probably be reading this stuff for the rest of my life until I actually figure something out. Who knows? But Tolstoy's, Tolstoy's a confession, right? You pick up his other books, War and Peace, uh, Crime and Punishment. I was just at Barnes & Noble's. 800, 700 pages. I'm like, Jesus, man, how am I going to read these books? Eventually, I'll get to them. So I started with a confession, over 100 pages maybe, um, and uh, went through it pretty quick. So Tolstoy. One thing I don't get, man, why are all these Russians, man, some of the best writers, you know, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, uh, Solzhenitsyn, who's the other guy? Anton Chekhov, I think was his name. All great writers, man, and they're all from Russia, and they all grew up in these awful, awful environments. Maybe that's the key, man. Maybe I need to move to Russia and start writing some books. I don't know, but Tolstoy, born in 1828, died in 1910. Arguably the greatest of all time, some might say. The GOAT, man, in in terms of literature. Now, he grew up the Crimean War. He was a soldier. He fought on it. He saw the darkest of dark, and he committed some of the most heinous stuff. You know, drunk, lied robbed people, committed adultery, violence against people, murdered people. He said himself, there was no crime I did not commit. Um, Nuts, right? Crazy that this guy grew up in that environment and then he used those experiences. We don't want to expose our children to that, like I said earlier, but he used those experiences to kind of become the man he is. Now, as he looked at his life and he looked at himself, he was like, this is from the book, like all lunatics, Simply called all men lunatics except myself. So as he committed these acts in the moment and then later on, he was like, all of these other people are crazy. I'm not the crazy one. You know, he he kind of ignored the fact that he just committed some some heinous acts. And as, as life went on, his brother, who he loved dearly, his brother dies. He was an incredible man and he suffered for over a year from the book here. He died painfully, not understanding why he had lived and still less why he had to die. So... In this book, you know, Tolstoy, we're going to get to what his confession is, but what really started think, got, got in him thinking in this direction was that death of his brother. His brother lived, and it was like, for what? Why did he live? You know, other than, you know, just being a more biological matter, you know, what was his purpose? And I've been not, I've been not, uh, not giving out sound advice jokingly, but like, you know, I said this before, it's like, you know, Tolstoy, this is the book where I got it from. It's like 200 years from now, Chris Fluke podcast, does that mean anything? Chris Fluke, does that mean anything? You know, Tolstoy was struggling with this too. He's writing these great pieces of work and it's like, is any is anybody going to care about this stuff in 200 years? In his case, yes, they did. We're almost at the 200 year mark now from some of these books and people are still reading them. But, but still, in the moment he was struggling here. You know, I from the book, I could breathe, eat, drink, sleep, but there was no life, for there were no wishes. Had a fairy come and offered to fulfill my desires, I should not have known what to ask. So it's like how many of us right now are going through life just kind of punching the clock every day, same old stuff. And if somebody just came to you and asked what your desire was for life or what you wish to ha- to, to do in life, would we have that answer? When I was seeing my my uh, advisor, my mind mechanic, my therapist, whatever you want to call it. One of the great things that this woman is having me do is all the stuff, is the things that I think we should do. 
she wants me to, to put a plan in place like, hey, six months, one year, five year, 10 year, 20 year plan. I've read that seven years ago. Did I do it? Probably half ass. Probably, probably did a half ass attempt at it, but then never did it again. Got me on track to doing that. You know, what are my wishes? Uh, she said lately, hey, create a mission statement for your life and everything should support that mission statement. And if it doesn't support, doesn't follow that mission statement, don't do it. Get rid of it. Um, she didn't say that part. That's how I interpreted it, though, where it's like if it doesn't support what your mission is, what your wish is, what you want to do with yourself, don't do it. It's just distracting you from what you want to do. I've been doing some stuff here in my job, and I'm like, this is it. This is workout strength. This is my business. Every All these little things I'm doing, they're just distractions. I'm like, it need, everything I do needs to support stuff here. I don't need to go work down the street at, uh, at some other gym for, uh, you know, a speed camp. You know, I do some stuff locally here because I like the community and I know families. And, you know, it just is a good, fun, positive thing. And I like coaching. But going out and doing some work for some other people, uh, I don't need to do it because it doesn't necessarily support what I'm doing here. It's just distracting me from creating a better environment here. You know, these are things that kind of go through my head. And having somebody to talk to helps me get there. Tolstoy struggled with it too. He didn't know what his purpose was. You know, a confession. This is it right here. He had to hide a cord to prevent hanging himself in his garage. And he ceased to go out shooting alone. I feared life, desired to escape from it, yet still hoped something of it. He, his confession was he didn't trust himself. He thought he was going to kill himself. He, he had a good plan. Remember what we talked about with these kids, man. You know, self-control it isn't about the ability in the moment to inhibit a behavior. Be prepared ahead of time to create an appropriate plan. Tolstoy's plan was, hey, I got to remove this cord. I can't be by myself uh, hunting in the woods with a gun because he didn't trust what, what he might do to himself. One of the greatest thinkers, one of the greatest authors of all time, even at this moment in time, it wasn't, it wasn't a case where he wasn't famous yet. He was. He had some great stuff out when he wrote this book. But he still didn't know what his purpose was. You know, all around me, um, yeah, anyway, so, you know, to go with, uh, sorry, I have to pull something up here from my, uh, from my iPad, but, you know, all, uh, all around me, I had, con I had what is considered complete good fortune, you know, everything was going good in his life, on paper, in theory, but, um, he still wasn't a happy individual, and I gotta pull this up here quick, sorry, um, you know, I felt that what I, uh, anyway, here we go. So you cannot understand the meaning of life, so do not think about it, but live. Tolstoy, bam. Oh, here, here we go. Sorry. Um, so this is it. I'm going back here. Sorry, guys. All around me, I had what is considered complete good fortune, Right? And all this befell me at a time when all around me was considered complete and good fortune. I was not yet 50. I had a good wife who loved me and whom I loved, good children, and a large estate, which without much effort on my part improved and increased. I was respected by my relations and acquaintances more than at any previous time. I was praised by others and without much self-deception. I could consider that my name was famous. And far from being insane or mentally diseased, I enjoyed, on the contrary, a strength of mind and body, such as I have seldom met with among men of my kind. Physically, I could keep up with the peasants at mowing, and mentally, I could work for eight and ten hours at a stretch without experiencing any ill results from such exertion. And in this situation, I came to this, that I could not live, and fearing death, had to employ cunning with myself to avoid taking my own life." He had to basically trick himself not, not to take his own life. Whew, crazy. That's why when you see this stuff, we can't, we can't be surprised by it. Just because somebody's a tremendous actor and they came out with all these great movies or that athlete that was great, just because they're great at that, they could still, be, they could still not be right up in their head. And they, they, you, you can't be surprised by some of this stuff. And you can't you know, just look at somebody and assume things are great because things are going great. It's why I read this stuff, because I need those reminders. And it, it's also good to know that, like, one of the greatest writers of all time did struggle, and there's going to be periods of time where things are going to stink, but you got to keep pushing and keep grinding forward, man. That is it. And 
you got to keep educating yourself and trying to find better ways. Um, sooner or later, my, my, my affairs, whatever they may be, will be forgotten and I shall not exist. Then why go on making any effort? Why continue going on if, if nobody's going to you know, value or remember you? Obviously, thinking that is kind of like a closed mindset, um, a fixed mindset. Shout out to Carol Dweck for teaching me that stuff. Um, it's, a, it's a fixed mindset. Um, your, your, your reach can affect other people, and then it trickles down. You know, I could affect one kid this way that I coach. That kid could affect somebody else and somebody else, and then so on and so forth, kind of like that pyramid scheme situation where if I'm at the head, I could start affecting people, and then they're branching off and affecting others. People aren't going to forget you. They're, they're, they're going to remember your influence, um, hopefully anyway, if you do good work. Um, all, you, back to the book. You cannot understand the meaning of life, so do not think about it, but live. That is it. You're never going to figure it out. You just got to live and stay in the moment. All who sought the meaning of life had found nothing. Is there any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy? Whew. Is there any meaning in my life that the inevitable death awaiting me does not destroy? Absolutely. I think the answer to that question is yes. We need to keep that in mind. Um, the way that this man writes and how dark... I don't want to say it's dark, but I guess it is, man. He just... Whew, gets to me, man. I love it. Um, next part here. The Socrates. We got a little quote from a man named Socrates, one of another great thinkers. We approach truth only in as much as we depart from life, said Socrates when preparing for death. For what do we who love truth strive after in life? To free ourselves from the body and from all the evil that is caused by the life of the body. If so, then how can we fail to be glad when death comes to us? The wise man seeks death all his life, and therefore death is not terrible to him. Whew, another tough one there, man. Uh, the, the suffering that does happen in life, I don't know, man. That's tough. That's a tough one to, to come by. Uh, you know, to free ourselves from the body and from the evil that is caused by the life of the body. If so, then how can we feel to be glad when death comes to us? When it is framed in that... In that way, it is hard to, to argue it, but um, we cannot let that thought affect us how we do how we do our things day to day. For in much wisdom is much grief. The more we know, going back to that quote, and then going with back to the book here, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. It's like that ignorance is bliss thing where it's like some people, they're just content, happy, whatever. It's the thinking you mind that gets us into trouble where it's like we know that death is inevitable. We know there's going to be future suffering. We know that life is what it is. Um, we know that there might not be fairness in this world. No, we all know that and we kind of anticipate and it's kind of hard to kind of get out of the brain. Whereas is it better to just kind of be ignorant to things and just saying to myself like, hey, whatever, uh, life's good, man. I get to go to work every day. I get this and that. I don't think about X, Y, and Z, you know. Can't take your money to the grave was a little quote that my boy Mike Ferg had back in college where he just kind of lived his life uh, in a way that uh, he wasn't too worried about other things. So it's like the more you learn, for in much wisdom is much grief. He that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. The more you learn, I guess, the more, um, more potential sorrow. Back to the book. For him that is among the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. So it doesn't matter what you were in your previous life. Say that lion would devour, destroy that doggy. But if the lion's dead, it doesn't matter. No, that dog's still alive and that dog still has a chance to do some good and to make things happen in this world. A living dog is better than a dead lion. I kind of like that one. All right. And is that the fate of all men? Will the same thing happen to me? Will they bury me? And shall I cause a stench and be eaten by worms? So the answer is yes. Um, you know, six, seven years ago, I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking about this right now. I think we're approaching seven years now. Uh, yeah, so hard, hard Thing to me, and we're going to start transitioning to some other thoughts, and we're Tolstoy-led, you know, 
my brother died six or seven, we're approaching seven years, say. Uh, you know, you put him in a casket, you lower the casket into the ground and you cover it with dirt. I had the hardest time. And I still do. It's like, you just put in the ground, right? Uh, there's a local woman in town here that is, she talks to angels. You know, that's her job. She's a whisperer. She has communication with uh, spirits, angels that are, are watching over us, maybe dead relatives and people from our past, whatever. You know, she's able to communicate with them. And I'm still in my mind like, nah, he's dead. He's in the ground. So, you know, and I, and I know, you know, Tolstoy wrote about it decades before, but I've had the same thought that when this happened, it's like, is that what's going to happen to me? You know, you just go in the ground, your body decomposes, worms eat you, whatever it may be. Um, is that really it? Kind of think it is. Now the Buddha, some, some, some scholar known as the Buddha said, to live in the consciousness of the inevitability of suffering, of becoming enfeebled, of old age and of death is impossible. We must free ourselves from life, from all possible life. So free yourself from that, from the uh, being conscious of, of what is going to happen. Um, I think that's kind of key. We all know which way things are going. And we need to be accepting of those things as opposed to trying to fight it or ignore it. I think, you know, knowing that that is part of the equation and part of life will hopefully allow us to enjoy this moment right now, this this moment of consciousness. <sighs> the Buddha dropping knowledge. One cannot cease to know what one does know. If I know I will end up in the ground, potentially getting eaten by worms one day, I cannot get that thought out of my head. One cannot cease to know what one does not, they, oh, sorry, to know what one does know. You know, that's part, that's life. I'm going to probably circle that because that one hits me in a bunch of different levels in the sense of the what ifs, the, I don't think this is going to, I don't think this is going to be a good idea. Uh, whatever it may be. It's like, if you know, if you know something, cause you experienced it before, you're like right up on it or you're pretty confident in your ability to like judge a situation. You can't get it out of your head. Like it becomes it becomes fate, I guess, and it becomes what happens in the future. Um, yeah, man. So Epicureanism, making use of all the advantages one has. Solomon, man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. Good point. I'm going to kind of, uh, I might have to take that advice. And when I get out of here, go get some good grub. Um, Seeing the truth of the situation and yet clinging to life. I'm back to the book here. Knowing in advance that nothing could come of it. People of this kind know that death is better than life, but not having the strength to act rationally. To end the deception quickly and kill themselves. They seem to wait for something. So Tolstoy, in his thought process, there's a few things that you can do. You could accept life. Uh, you could have a different mindset. You could... Uh, Kill yourself, or you could understand that death is inevitable and then just continue to go through life moping around and uh, being all down in the dumps. Um, I guess he said that that was cowardly. You know, that's a serious decision to take your own life, right? But if you could kind of backtrack a little bit and, 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 and go to other areas of life, you know, acting cowardly where you know what the rational thought is, where it's like, hey, I need to tell this person that they're fired. You know your rational mind says that, but you're you're cowardly and you can't bring yourself to do it. That's an issue. Um, and I that's kind of what I got out of that quote. See the truth in a situation. Um, use your rational brain, but then follow through and act rationally. Don't avoid it. Obviously, Tolstoy was in that grouping. He was one to seem to wait for something. And what is that something? Faith. Interesting. I didn't expect this book to go in this direction. Now, taking a sidetrack here. Actually, I'll read this first. That rational knowledge is faith, that very thing which I could not but reject. I cannot accept as long as I retain my reason. In his mind, he was like, he just couldn't understand somebody walking on water, somebody parting a sea, um, things like that. 
being a religious individual was just not even on his radar. And it brought me back to uh, two things. One, back, I actually learned something in college. Shout out to Bloomsburg University. You know, I used to tell people I, I, I drank eight days a week at this university. I thought all it did was teach me uh, terrible drinking habits and routines. But really, I remembered something from a philosophy class. Blaise Pascal, 1600 thinker, Pascal's wager. Um, so basically, uh, I had to sum this thing up. You know, probably this is a groundbreaking probability theory in the 1600s. The existence and non-existence of God are impossible to prove by human reason. Supposing that reason, one must wager by weighing the possible consequences. All right, Pascal argues that a rational per person should live as though God exists and seek to believe in God. If he doesn't exist, it's only a finite loss. If God doesn't exist, you become that individual that is buried in the ground, getting eaten by worms. Big deal. You're dead anyway, right? If he does exist, there's infinite gains. You get to go to heaven and you get to live infinitely, I guess. Um, he point, Pascal points out that if a wager was between the equal chance of gaining another lifetime in heaven of happiness and gaining nothing in the ground, then a person could be, would be a fool to bet on the latter. Put that way, makes sense. Pascal, 1600s, nice job thinking this one through. Um, Tolstoy kind of went along in the same boat here. Another thing that I've read too that I wanted to point out, Hillbilly Elegy, uh, good book, not great, good book. J.D. Vance wrote it. He's a he's going to church, man. He feels good about his faith. But and he cited some research about um, people are just happier that go to church, that have faith in something, that believe in a higher power. Uh, yeah. So anyway, Tolstoy starts to stumble upon this. Didn't expect it from this book, but it came. Um, faith is the strength of life. If a man lives. He believes in something. If he did not believe that one must live for something, he would not live. He was searching for it, man. He had all of the all of the he had fortune, he had family, all the stuff that I talked about. But he was still missing something, you know. He said, "If I asked if that genie came and offered me a wish, what would I give?" No clue. What did he need? He needed something to live for, and his faith gave it to him, man. So Tolstoy decides, "Hey, I'm going to jump into this thing." which I got respect for, big time respect for it. And uh, so what did he do, man? I was now ready to accept any faith. And he started doing the research. If only it did not demand of me a direct denial of reason, which would be a falsehood. So in his mind, he started studying everything, man, a lot of different religions, um, and tried to find whatever worked for him. I don't even know what he found out, what, he, what, he le what led him to that. He's talking about God, so obviously some sort of Christian Catholic base is what I assumed at the time. Why did I assume that? I don't know. But as long as it didn't, uh, as long as it didn't mess with his, his his reason, where he he started having faith in something, but he still, you know, he didn't want to be told that story. Um, you know, I'll just go to a different part of the book here to kind of sum it up. Uh, you know, let us love one another in conf in conformity. That's what he believed. You know, in unity we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. He passed by those thoughts because he couldn't understand them. So he couldn't understand necessarily, you know, the story of Jesus, God, Holy Ghost, yada, yada, yada. But he could get behind the idea of let us love one another in conformity, which it's like you can't argue with that thought. It's Pascal's wager. It's like there's no reason, there's no uh, way to go against it. it. You know, who doesn't believe in love, right? Back to the book. The only mistake was that the answer referred only to my life, but I had referred to life in general. I asked myself what my life is and got the reply, an evil and an absurdity. And really my life, a life of indulgence of desires, was senseless and evil. And therefore the reply, life is evil and an absurdity, referred only to my life, but not to human life in general. I understood the truth, which afterwards I found in the Gospels, that men love darkness rather than the light, for their works were evil. For everyone that doeth ill hateth the light and cometh not to the light, lest his work should be reproved. It's like, it's almost that fine line we talked about. Every man's got that light side and that dark side in their heart. And for some reason, well, no, I don't want to say most men, but he, you know, that desire for the indulgences and some of the other actions that happen in his life, 
those were dark moments. And now that he's, you know, founding faith and founding reason for life, he's able to appreciate those, appreciate those light moments now. Because without the darkness, you can't appreciate the light. Now, this one was one of those things that I enjoyed because it was kind of dark, but yet super positive. Every man can destroy his soul or save it. We all have those choices, guys, girls, kids watching this thing. You have the choice. Destroy it or save it. Um, the essence of every faith consists in its giving life a meaning, which death does not destroy. That's what faith is. Giving my life a meaning where I know that death is not just going to eliminate anything that I've done. Bad, I consider the indulgence of one's desires. So he spoke He spoke of it yet again a little bit later in the book. You know, where he was talking about the indulgence that he had, and he looked around and was like, man... Why was he living that way that he lived? Because it wasn't fulfilling, it wasn't giving him meaning, and it wasn't giving him purpose. And I'm just going to repeat this part of it again because I think it's important. You know, in the Mass that he went to, the most important words for me were, you know, love. Let us love one another in conformity. That's what it was about. It wasn't about the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. It was about those rational lessons that he learned in the church that, are really, that really stuck with him and gave him meaning and gave him purpose, which I got respect for that. Um, and lastly here, man, oh, this is it, because this kind of contradicts some of this stuff, too, in the sense that, like, you know what, he appreciated the church, but the, the way that he grew up, when I talked about some of the evils that he did, man, and besides the murders during the war, I saw, during the disturbances which followed the war, church dignitaries and teachers and monks of the lesser and stricter orders who approved the killings of helpless, erring youths, and I took note of all that is done by men who profess Christianity, and I was horrified. Um, you know, so these teachers of faith acknowledge killing, encourage killing. That's where the struggle came from. And that's where the struggle comes from, I think, in my personal life right now. You see all these terrible stories in the news. It's like, come on, man, get out of here with that stuff. And, and it's hard to get by it. But if you could keep that, that stuff and in, in, keep that in, in, in mind, you could still learn from some of these lessons. You shouldn't, you shouldn't just throw that stuff away. You shouldn't throw away that lesson of let us love one another in conformity just because you don't agree with what goes on in the Catholic Church or in any other church. Um, those lessons are great. They've been around for thousands of years, and I don't think they're ever going to go away, and I feel like we need them more now than ever. Boom! That is it, guys. Leo Tolstoy, dark, heavy book. Man, confession. Loved it. Um, in an effort to get our minds right, that's what it's all about. We just got to keep reading. We got we to gotta keep studying. We got to keep trying to get after it, not only in the weight room, but also in the, that mental gym, man, that, that mental space here. We got to work this muscle just as hard as we work those, those other muscles. Now, speaking of other muscles, I forgot to talk about this in the beginning. I actually had to stop the podcast before some dude was mowing his lawn, had to stop it and then restart it, close the windows up. But anyway, physical challenges and how important are they? I talk about it all the time. I'm actually training at a pretty, uh, sorry, I almost said I'm training at a high level. I'm not. I'm trying to get a lot of work in it. Uh, and I get it in whenever I can. This past month, a thousand pull-ups or chin-ups. I said, I'm just going to do a thousand this month. Boom. Let's make it happen. Finish that up today. Uh, August 31st, last day of the month. Hit, hit my last hundred. Felt pretty good. Um, you know, some of this stuff starting to carry over in other areas. My deadlift is going up. My shoulder's feeling good. And I'm like, man, you start pushing a little bit, you start feeling good. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, I jacked my ankle up. Uh, this is a story all in itself. But let's say a couple months ago, I was out running. Um, I was running hills and stuff, and I'm like, dude, my Turkish get-ups are getting better. My pull-ups are getting easier. I'm somehow getting a stronger deadlift just because my fitness was getting better. So it's like we can't deny that stuff. Um, you need to get out there. You need to push yourself. You need to run some hills. You need to set a crazy number and just try to get after it. thousand chin-ups, pull-ups in a month. Sounds like a lot, but if you break it down, it's not. Set a challenge for yourself this month of September. Um, broken ankle story, though, this is going to be it, guys. Out there doing a little bit of work on a farm, stepped in a gopher hole, man. My whole leg went in this hole right up to my knee. Uh, I thought, well, one, I whew, get, gave a sigh of relief as I didn't snap my leg in half. But anyway, I still got some residual training effects from that. So I've been walking. This weather's ideal right now up here in Pennsylvania. And I'm like, I got to get back to running. I tested it out a few weeks ago, feeling pretty good. Maybe this month, in addition to those uh, chin-ups, I might try to run. Hmm. What do I do? What do I do here? Maybe try to get two sessions in a week. 
I'm putting it on video right now. 1,000 pull-ups and chin-ups, two sessions in a week. I'm still hitting a juggernaut program that we're going to have to break down for you one day for the front squat. I'm still hitting some hand cleans. I'm, I'm pressing weight overhead. And I'm doing some core-related stuff, carrying kettlebells, a little sled work. Uh, that's about it. I'm trying to train the glutes, hitting the reverse hyper pretty good. We don't have to do a lot, guys. Challenge yourself, though, with whatever you do. Um, get out there and experience new things like we talked about. Ha always have a plan in place for whatever you're doing. Stick to that plan, whether it's time-restricted eating, whether it's teaching kids and adolescents what to do, whether it's like Leo Tolstoy who feared being by himself. Have a plan in place. Avoid the negativity and keep getting after it, man. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. I hope you like this podcast. We are on Google Play, Stitcher, iTunes. Like it. Subscribe it. This is going to be on YouTube. I'm, I'm making an effort. My next challenge is to get this out to the masses, and I need to get marketing. If anybody knows somebody out there that works, college kid, maybe an internship situation, four or five hours a week, I need some help. I need help with the online stuff. Let me know. Get in contact. BrickHouseStrength.com. You can find Chris Fluke online. You can find him on Instagram. That's me, by the way. I'm talking in the third person. Find me anywhere. Email me, whatever you want to do. But I'm looking for some interns. I'm looking for help to get this podcast out to the masses. If you know anybody that could be an awesome guest, bring them on. I would love to interview them. Hope you guys have a great day. Peace, everybody.